Thanks, Todd. Here is what I want to share with you. All right. Every photon has a story. Where he was born, who he met, where he is going. I want to listen to this photon. And if I can get to know him, he can tell me some amazing things. How about a camera that can look around corners, see inside this room, and more specifically, maybe somebody specific in that room? The photons are bouncing around. There's a photon from inside the room that somehow is going to reach my camera. Maybe I can try to help and use a flashlight that shines on the door, hits uh, your friend inside, this photon, and the photon comes back all the way back to the camera after multiple bounces. But the problem is I would like to interview this photon. Where did you come from? Did you come from the wall? Did you come from my friend? Where did you come from? And of course, the photon is in a hurry. He has to travel at the speed of light. <laughs> so we must catch up with this photon and do something that's compatible with the speed of light. So we have invented a new type of photography, femtophotography. We're using high-speed high -speed cameras that run at one million, one billion, one trillion frames per second, and flashes that are also on for less than one trillionth of a second. And there better be really serious synchronization, because if you sneeze, uh, it's all going to go off. And what can you do if you have cameras that can look around corners? We can use them for rescue and planning by shining light through visible parts, such as windows, um, and look at reflected photons. We can build robots and vehicles which can plan their path even before they take the bend. But what we're really focusing on are applications in endoscopy. For bronchoscopy, where you can look at the nooks and crannies of different cavities. In colonoscopy, where uh, you wouldn't be limited with the physical reaches of, of your endoscopes. And of course, cardioscopy. So how, how do we get there? How do we build these cameras that are running at trillion frames per second? Well, in chemistry, the solution was already available. Back in 1999, there was a Nobel Prize uh, in femtochemistry. So all we're doing is using these femtosecond lasers, um, and we're using streaked cameras that are, again, used uh, in chemistry and high-energy physics. Uh, to make this happen. But the lasers themselves are only about half watt. So they're not that different from what they're used uh, in other industrial applications. And the street cameras are expensive, but will catch up and possibly bring them in, in, you know, in everybody's pocket here. And when we put that together, we have a new form of mathematics that we call transient imaging for photography. So how does pictures from a trillion frames per second camera look like? It's actually a one-dimensional camera. And on the x-axis, you have the space. And on the y-axis, you have a resolution of one picosecond, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. And depending on where you shine light on the door, uh, you would get these very funky-looking images that will move as you shine different spots on the door of any or any object in beyond the line of sight uh, starts moving. And I'm not showing you the results. For that, you would, like, you would have to come upstairs right in our camera culture area and see how we can look around corners. And with that, maybe we can help the bunny figure out if it's safe enough to enter the room, uh, you know, and if Elmer is still there. Uh, 
And while we're helping the bunny, something strange is happening in the world. The barcodes are taking over the world. A billion people and more every year have a camera in their pocket. And these barcodes are trying to communicate with us. But they are for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. They're not for humans. They're just ugly. So we said, let, it's time to upgrade uh, these barcodes and make our world more, more intelligent. So you're all familiar with uh, different types of barcodes. The micro dot in the middle is our solution. It's a new form of a barcode, just that, this tiny dot here. Well, how would you see it? To a, naked, to, a, to a camera in sharp focus or to a naked eye, it looks like a micro dot. But if you just throw the camera out of focus, it will reveal the information that's encoded there. So the bokeh, which is typically a circle of confusion in a camera, becomes a circle of information. And here, the information is being encoded in angle rather than in space or wavelength or time. And what you saw, the, the animation, is not zooming in of the camera. It's an ordinary camera with a sufficiently large aperture and simply going out of focus. Right? So I was very proud of this device. And uh, I, after we built this, I took it home and I showed it to my wife. Um, and the interesting part about this is you can also hold it right next to your eye, and you can kind of see the pattern. And when I showed it to her, she couldn't see it very well, uh, which is strange, because everybody else I had shown it to here in the office was able to see it and, and appreciate it. So I said, let's look, let's look at it with your other eye. And when she looked at it with her left eye, it was very clear to her, the pattern. Very strange. So she made a very important comment. She said, wow, maybe you can use these bow codes uh, to figure out if people have normal eyesight. And being an engineer, I said, wow, that's not the point, just telling you whether you have good eyesight or bad eyesight, but I would like to measure what the problems with your eyesight are. And out of that came our next project called Netra. And the idea behind Netra is, is really simple. We have a clip-on eyepiece that goes on top of a cell phone. You would look through this eyepiece and interactively aligns the patterns displayed on the LCD using the keyboard on your phone. Hit calculate, and it will give you the information for your prescription data for your eyeglasses, your nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. Now, the challenge here is really big. Two billion people worldwide have a refractive error, but unfortunately about half a billion, and most of them in developing countries, have uncorrected refractive error, uh, which affects their daily livelihood. It leads to illiteracy and poverty. And while there have solutions have emerged for dispensing glasses, measuring the refractive error is still very, very challenging. Well, you would say, why not just use a reading chart? The problem with reading chart is that the measurements are very subjective, and you still need four opters or trial lens frames and a trial lens set, which can cost $100 or $200, even in developing country scenario. So people have come up with all kinds of clever solutions, some of them from right here uh, in Media Lab, but all of them involve moving parts or lasers or, 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 or um, need for a, a trained healthcare worker. And as you can see nicely on the right side, our solution is all green. It has all the intelligence is really in the software of the, the, the mobile phone. And the principle here is it's, it's not some kind of a reading chart that we are just mapping onto a cell phone. The solution here is very similar to a shock Hertman sensor, uh, a device that you would stick your eye in just before doing your LASIK surgery, so you would get a map, refractive map of your eye. We're doing exactly that, but doing it in the reverse direction, realizing that your cell phone displays now are extremely high resolution. At 300 DPI uh, of, of current cell phone displays, the pixel pitch is about 30 micrometers, which is half the width of a human hair. And at that resolution of your phone, display of your phone, 
you can start doing things that are possible with only the highest end scientific instrument. So the task uh, you have to perform to, to get your uh, uh, prescription data is to simply align these patterns that the camera would have measured in a traditional LASIK surgery pre-equipment such as a shock Hartman sensor. <clears throat> and so this is, this is interesting, right? Because we are all familiar with software app store where we would download applications, but maybe we're entering an era of hardware app store where you would get a $1 or $2 clip-on that goes on top of your phone and it can be used for, uh, for monitoring health, for productivity, entertainment, and so on. And again, we are at the tip of the iceberg because most people think of cell phone as just a small computer, right? All the computing power is here and communication is power here. But th there's something fundamental about mobile phones. For example, the display of a mobile phone is much higher quality than any display you will find elsewhere. So just think of that. More than four billion people in the world are carrying a high-end scientific instrument in their pocket. This is going to change the game. So as you can see, a lot of our work is about using unusual optics, programmable illumination, and sensors, and doing a core design of optical processing and digital processing. And I would encourage you to come upstairs to our area to see how we are converting cell phone cameras to behave as good as SLRs, how we can create four-dimensional, not three-dimensional, four-dimensional displays by exploiting algebraic rank constraint, a uh, lot of work in Fourier optics that marries the wave and particle nature of light, uh, and new forms of motion capture uh, that's imperceptible. So you'll realize when you visit us that we, when we work with photons, we try to nudge them, we try to send them in different directions, we tend to observe them, and when they come back to us, we like to talk to them. And we really handle them with a lot of love and care because every photon has a story. Thank you.